Uh, given that we're walled in still, and it's winter, <laughs> given we're walled in in winter, seem to natural to read, uh, continue to read uh, the real walled in, which is the prose journals. <laughs> more professional out there who read the journals, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, we should read selected journals or the complete journals? Mm -hmm. I think we'll have to read selected at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, in the past I've done selected readings, mm -hmm. but we're not selecting. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the extensive edition necessary. Mm -hmm. 1838. Well, this would be before he even goes to Walden. We're going by years now. Unshackled though he aim to be. This is the, the introduction. Thoreau felt that he ought to look for work. He tried for months to get a permanent job as a teacher but was unsuccessful. He even went to Maine in his search. In June, he opened his own small school in Concord. Now, uh, you see, this is where he had well, Lisa May Alcott as a student. <laughs> Terms are $6 per quarter. Hmm. You could go for $6 a quarter. Meanwhile, the call of the wood lamps and the streams around Concord grew insistent. He gave the first of what would be a number of public lectures at the Concord Lyceum and elsewhere the subject was society. The surviving parts of the journal include some of his notes for it. The journal also reveals the early stages of the four kinds of writing that would give it and daughter in the distinction of descriptions of nature. Descriptions of wildlife, the reflections on man's conduct, the sketches of characters in the human comedy. In addition, there is a fair amount of his youthful poetry as well, then as considerable quotation from classical writers. <laughs> so, if we recall, I think he had finished uh, Harvard. Uh -huh. What's his age at this point? I know a Alexa is sleeping, so she won't help us. <laughs> Heaven on Earth. And now this is from the journal. Heaven on Earth, January 6th. Um, as a child looks forward to the coming of the summer, so could we contemplate with quiet joy the circle of the seasons. We're turning without fail eternally as the spring came round during so many years of the gods. We could go out to admire and adore anew our Eden and yet never tire. Before he said that in Walden, he had said that spring was like the golden age. <laughs> hmm. But here he says spring is heaven on earth, so. Saxons, January 15th, after all that has been said in praise of the Saxon race, we must allow that our blue-eyed and fair-haired ancestors were originally an ungodly and reckless crew. Yeah, we had a, a shortage of Englishmen, the English that's uh, become dominated now by by uh, the Spanish uh, because Anglo-Saxons are an ungodly reckless crew. We made our own fortune. January 16th, man is like a cork uh, which no tempest can sink. But it will float securely to its haven at last. The world 
the server, the less beautiful, the beautiful of chink or not hole. You know what a chink is? It's a knot hole. It's a hole in the wall. Man is like a cork to which no tempest can sink, but it will float still to its haven at last. The world is nevertheless beautiful, the beautiful of chink. Oh. Means we make our own fortune. Society, February 9th, it is wholesome advice, quote, to be a man amongst the folks, go into society, if you will, or if you are unwilling, and take a human interest in its affairs, if you mistake these messieurs and madames for so many men and women, it is but erring on the safe side, or rather, it is their error and not yours, armed with a manly sincerity, you shall not be trifled with. But drive this business of life. It matters not how many men are to be addressed, for beautiful provided one man rebuke them. Do you think we should live trifling lives? And that we should be sincere, armed with manly sincerity. We shall not be trifled with. We're trying not to be trifled with by reading a not so trivial writing for Henry David Thoreau. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Small talk. To manage the small talk of a party is to make an effort to do what was at first done admirably because naturally you have your fire quiet side. Influence. February 13th. It is hard to subject ourselves to an influence. Uh -huh. It must steal upon us when we expect it not, and its work will be all done ere we are aware of it. If we make advances, it is shy. If when we feel its presence, we presume to pry into its freemasonry, it vanishes and leaves us alone in our folly. Brimful but stagnant and full channel, it may be, but no incarnation. I think we should just allow ourselves to be influenced by others, easily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many channels did my friend have on this page? He was decluttering and he had so many journals. Mm -hmm. Goodness. Oh, it must have been 50 or something. Who knows? Should look it up. He was a heavy journaler. Mm -hmm. All fear, fear, all fear of the world or consequences is swallowed up in a manly anxiety to do truth justice. Old books, February 15th, the true student will cleave ever to the good, recognizing no past, no present. But wherever he emerges from the bosom of time, his course is not with the sun, eastward or westward, but ever towards the seashore. Day and night pursues he his devious way, wondering by how many a Viantarian string, how many an Academus throw, how many a sculptured portico, all with spring grove and portico lie, not so wide, but he may take them conveniently in his way. Ah, <sighs> sounds like you read too many classical books. Greece, February 16, in imagination, I, I, my, to Greece, as to enchanted ground, no storms vex her coast, no clouds encircle her helicon or Olympus, no tempest sweep the peaceful Tempe, or ruffle the bosom of the placid Aegean, but always the beams of the summer sun gleam along the entablature of the Acropolis. Uh, 
uh, reflected through the mellow atmosphere from a thousand consecrated groves and fountains. Always a sea girt pious are dallying with the zephyr guest. Uh -huh. And the low of keen time is heard along the meads, and the transcape sleeps. Valley and hill and woodland a dreamy sleep. Each of her sons created a new heaven and a new earth for Greece. We just read Henry Perry de Thoreau's description of Greece. February 16th, 1838. Greece. In imagination, I eye me to Greece as to enchanted ground. No storms vex her coast, no clouds encircle her helicon or Olympus, no tempests sweep the peaceful Tempe or ruffle the bosom of the placid Aegean. But always the beams of the summer sun gleam along the entablature of the Acropolis and are reflected through the mellow atmosphere from a thousand consecrated groves and fountains. Always her sea-girt eyes are dallying with the zephyr guest. He could be the zephyr guest on the Greek island. And the low of kine is heard along the meads, and the landscape sleeps. Valley and hill and woodland, the dreamy sleep. Each of her sons created a new heaven and a new earth for Greece. I don't know if he is a son of Greece in a way. Sunday, February 18th, Riley named Sunaday. I like it when it's sunny on Sunday. The day of the sun. I think when they go to church, it should be sunny for Sunday. I don't like it when it's not sunny on Sunday. Rightly named Sun a Day or Day of the Sun. Uh, one is satisfied in some angle by wood house and garden fence to bask in her beams, to exist barely the livelong day. Hmm. Spring. I had not been out long today, when it seemed that a new spring was already born, not quite weaned, it is true, but fairly entered upon existence. Nature struck up the same old song in the grass, despite 18 inches of snow, and I contrived to smuggle away a grin of satisfaction by a smother. And is that all? Well, remember, it's still February and he's obsessing over spring. What to do, March 5th? What, uh, but what does all this scribbling amount to? What is now scribbled in the heat of the moment one can contemplate with somewhat of satisfaction, but alas. Tomorrow, a eh, tonight, it is stale, flat, and unpreferable. In fine, is not only it shall remain, it's like some red parboiled lobster shell, which slipped aside, never so often still stares at you in the path. March 14th, if thy neighbor hail thee to inquire, how goes the world, feel thyself put to thy trump to return a true and explain explicit answer. Plant the feet firmly, and will he merely dole out to him the strict and conscientious impartiality his modicum of a response. Let not society be the element in which you swim, or are tossed about at the mercy of the waves. 
but be rather a strip of firm land running out into the sea whose base is daily washed by the tide, but whose summit only the spring tide can reach. But after all, such a morsel of society as this will not satisfy a man. But like those women of Malamoco and Tesfatria, who, when their husbands are fishing at sea, repair to the shore and sing their shrill songs at evening till they hear the voices of their husbands in reply borne to them over the water. So go we about indefectibly, cramping our stanza of the lay and waiting the response of a kindred and soul out of the distance. About what to do? Title, of what shall I do? When I have nothing, when we have nothing to do, the default is meditate. If you can't have, don't have anything to do, then that's a sign that it's time to meditate. What to do? Journey to Maine, May 3rd to 4th, Boston to Portland. Journey to Maine, Boston to Portland, May 3rd to 4th. What indeed is this earth to us of New England but a field for Yankee speculation? The man plucked it, whaler goes a fishing round it, and so knows it. What is it is? How long? How broad? And that no tortoise sustains it, he who has visited the confines of his real estate. Looking out on all sides into space will feel a new inducement to be the world of creation. We must all pay a small tribute to Neptune, the chief engineer must once have been seasick. Midnight head over the boat's side, between sleeping and waking, with glimpses of one or more lights in the vicinity of Cape Ann. Bright moonlight, the effect heightened by sea sickness. Beyond that light, yonder have my lines hitherto been cast. But now I know that there lies not the whole world, for I can say it is there and not here. May 4th, Portland. There is a proper and only right way to enter a city as well as to make advances to a strange person. Neither will allow the least forwardness nor bustle. A sensitive person can hardly elbow his way boldly leaping and plucking into a strange town without experiencing some twinges of conscience, as when he has tried a stranger with too much familiarity. We're not supposed to always expose the stranger to too much familiarity. Portland to Bath via Brunswick, Bath to Brunswick, May 5th. Each one's world is but a clearing in the forest, so much open and enclosed ground. When the mail coach rumbles into one of these, the villagers gaze after you with a compassionate look, as much as to say, quote, Where have you been all this time that you made your debut in the world at this late hour? Nevertheless, here we are. Come and study us that you may learn men and manners. You're sleeping. The way I sing puts you to sleep. This is used to put you to sleep um, because the way I talk is puts a person to sleep. It's so boring. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's recorded so when they're awake they can listen again. Mm -hmm. When I'm old and turn a hundred, I'm going to review some of these uh, recordings. Uh, of course, I'll live past a hundred because I 
devoted to my knees and hips and, and I read even more about longevity than about Buddhism. Mm -hmm. What is it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to allow anybody in the tennis class. I think you have to, prerequisite is meditation. You have to meditate or you can't come to class. Like a, in college, you have a prerequisite. So if they haven't meditated for like three hours, I just boot them out. They're not able to play tennis. They don't have the concentration, proper mindfulness and nothing. Probably don't even look at the ball. May 6, Brunswick to Augusta via Gardner and Hollowell. May 7th, we occasionally met an individual of a character and disposition, so entirely the reverse of his own that we wonder if he can indeed be another man like ourselves, for we doubt if we ever can draw any nearer to him and understand him, such as the old English gentleman whom I met with today in H. <laughs> Though I peered in, in at his eyes, I could not discern myself reflected therein the chief wonder of, of how we could ever arrive at so fair seeming an intercourse upon so small ground of sympathy. He walked and fluttered like a strange bird at my side, prying into and making a handle of the least circumstance. The bustle and rapidity of our conversation was astonishing. He stated in our conversation all at once he would stop short in the path and in an abstracted air query whether the steamboat had reached Bath or Portland, addressing me from time to time in a familiar, familiar genius who could understand what was passing in his mind without the necessity of uninterrupted oral communication. Who did he go with to, uh, to Maine? Was it Bronson Alcott? <laughs> Do we remember our studies in the biography? No, we don't. We have to go back to the, to the book. May 8, August, to Bangor via China. Oh, goodness. Now he's going via China. May 10th, Bangor to Old Town. The railroad from Bangor to Old Town is civilization shooting off in a tangent into the forest. I had much conversation with an old Indian at the latter place who sat dreaming upon a scow at the waterside and striking his deerskin moccasins against the plank why his arms hung listlessly by his side. He was the most communicative man I had met. Interesting that the old Indian is the most communicative. That's that famous Indian, maybe, that he took as a scout on a canoe trip. Talked of fishing and hunting all times and new times, pointing up the but not Scott, he observed, two or three mile up the river, one beautiful country, and then as if he would come as far to meet me as I had gone to meet him, he exclaimed, Ugh, one very hard time, and he had mistaken his man. May 11th, Bonger to Belfast via Saturday Cove, May 10th. May 12th, Belfast. May 13th, to Caston by sailboat, Cinderella. May 14th, Caston to Belfast by packet, Captain Skinner. Found the poems of Burns uh, in an odd volume of the spectator in the cabin. He's saying that in the cabin of the boat, he found the poems of Burns. Uh, May 15th, Belfast to Bath by a Tomstone on May 16th to Portland, May 17th to Boston, Concord. May morning. This is like a poem, I think. May morning, May 21. Hmm. The 
schoolboy loitered on his way to school, learning to live so rare a day by rule. So mild the air of pleasure, t'was to breathe, for what seemed heaven above was earth beneath. Sour neighbors chatted by the garden pale, nor quelled uh, who shed uh, drive the need of mail. The most unsocial maids new friends said they, as when the sunshine tan husbandmen make hay. How long I slept I know not, but at last I felt my consciousness returning fast. Twas ever rustled past with leafy tread, and heedlessly with one heel clazed my head. My eyelids opened on a field of blue, for close above a nodding violet grew. A part of heaven, it seemed, which one can scent, uh, its blue commingling with the firmament. Uh, do you like his poem? <laughs> We're reading Henry David Thoreau in his journals, his poetry. Uh, it's recorded no, I think it's his poem. You would have said so. Sounds like him. Sounds like him. We don't know what the complete poems are for so, uh, yeah. Well, we have the journal, so he didn't. I don't know if he even published a poetry book. We know nothing about Thoreau. Despite studying Thoreau, because he lived a poem. His life was a poem. His life style is a poem that followed. Mm -hmm. Consciousness, August thirteenth. If with closed ears and eyes I consult consciousness for a moment, immediately are all walls and barriers dissipated, earth rose from under me, and I float by the impetus derived from the earth and the system, a subjective, heavily laden thought in the midst of an unknown and infinite sea, or else heave and swell like a vast ocean of thought, without rock or headland. Where are all riddles solved, all straight lines making there? There are two ends uh, to meet, eternity and space, gambling familiarly through my depths. I am from the beginning, knowing no end, no aim, no sun illuminates me, for I dissolve all lesser lights in my own. Intenser and steadier light, I am a restful kernel in the magazine of the universe. Thank goodness. It's almost like a poem. <laughs> It's like a journal entry. Interesting description of consciousness. Do you think he's a consciousness only Buddhist? Or nothing exists but consciousness? By default. Consciousness. Again, we're beginning to come more conscious of his consciousness by rereading August 13th, 1838. If with closed ears and eyes I consult consciousness for a moment, immediately are all walls and barriers dissipated. Earth rolls from under me, and I float. By the impetus derived from the earth and the system, a subjective heavily laden thought in the midst of an unknown and infinite sea, or else heave and swell like a vast ocean of thought. Without rock or headland, where are all riddles solved? Do you think he can solve all his riddles at just at the point of his third eye? All straight lines making there their two ends to the meet. Eternity and space gambling. <laughs> gambling. G A M B O L L I N G. Space gambling. Familiarly. 
through my depths to I am from the beginning, knowing no end, no aim, no sun illuminates me, for I dissolve all lesser lights in my own intenser and steadier light. Do you think he has an internal sun? Look how bright is his internal sun. I am a restful kernel in the magazine of the universe. <laughs> Goodness, we read too much uh, Bhagavad Gita Upanishads, maybe. I shouldn't study Eastern books, <laughs> most are too tantric. <laughs> resource, next section is resource. Men are constantly dinging, dinging in my ears, dinging in my ears. They're fair theories and plausible solutions of the universe, but ever there is no help, and I return again to my shoreless, islandless ocean, and phantom unceasingly for a bottom that will hold an anchor, that it may not drag. Oh, interesting. Is that why he went to Walden? Here's why he may have went to what resource. Men are constantly dinging in my ears their fair theories and plausible solutions of the universe, but ever there is no help. And I return again to my shoreless, islandless ocean, being Walden Pond, <laughs> and fathom unceasingly for a bottom, for the bottom of Walden Pond, for a bottom that will hold an anchor, that it may not drag. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> Evening sounds, May, August 26. See, we have some order here. We have a chronological order. We needed order to our consciousness, <laughs> to the journaling. Evening sounds, how strangely sounds of revelry strike the ear from our cultivated fields by the woodside. While the sun is declining in the west, it is a world we had not known because before. We listen and are capable of no mean act or thought. We tree tread on Olympus and participate in the councils of the gods. <laughs> I think he read a lot of Greek stuff um, in, in original Greek. The Loss of a Tooth, August 27. Verily, I am a creature of circumstances. Here I've swallowed an indispensable tooth, and so in no whole man he lost a tooth. But a lame and halting piece of mankind, I am conscious of no gap in my soul, but I would seem that now the entrance to the oracle has been enlarged, the more rare and commonplace the responses that issue from it. I have felt cheap and hardly dared hold up my head among men. Ever since this accident happened, nothing can I do as well and freely as before. Nothing do I undertake, but I am hindered and balked by the circumstances. What a great matter, a little spark kindleth. I believe if I were called at this moment to rush into the thickest of the fight, I should halt for lack of so insignificant a piece of armor as a tooth. Virtue and truth go undefended, and falsehood and affection are thrown in my teeth, though I am toothless. One does not need that the earth quake for the sake of excitement when so slight a thought proves such an impassable mot. moat. But let the lame man shake his leg and lash himself with the fleetest in the race. So shall he do what it is in him to do. But let him who has lost a tooth open his mouth wide and gabble, lisp and sputter never so resolutely. Did you ever hear the thing about the war was lost due to the lack of a nail? Mm -hmm. Do you think if they 
black the nails uh, for the loss of the war. The war was lost due to the lack of a nail. Spear music. September 2nd, the cocks chant the strain of which we never tire. Who's not tired of the cocks crowing? <laughs> the cocks chant the strain to which we never tire. Or you get tired of cocks crowing, do you? When you were on the farm. I don't think you thought about whether you're tired of them or just sort of crowed and that's the way it was. <laughs> I didn't speculate and that engage in abstract speculation about this uh, this issue of whether it was good or bad to have cocks crowing. That would be unnecessary abstract speculation. <laughs> September 2nd, the cocks chant a strain to which we never tire. Some there are who find pleasure in the melody of birds and the chirping of crickets, ah, even the peeping of frogs. Such faint sounds as these are for the most part heard above the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, which so unhallow the Sabbath among us. The moan the earth makes is, after all, a very faint sound infinitely inferior in volume to its creaking, but surely in gleeful manners, so that we may expect the next balloonist will rise above the utmost range of discordant sounds into the region of pure melody. Never so loud was the wail, but it seemed to taper off into a piercing melody, a note of joy, which lingered not among mid the clods of the belly. Hmm. Spear music. Do you think that's the music of the spheres, or what is he talking about? The pure melody. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. What whale? What's he yeah. talking about? Singing. Spear. Spear music. Spear. The pure melody of the spheres. <laughs> we don't know what it means. Anything? Not knowing anything, scholar. <laughs> My specialty is not to know anything. That's why I'm the foremost scholar. September 2nd, the Cox chant the strain of which we never tire. Some there are who find pleasure in the melody of birds and chuckling of crickets. Uh -huh. Ah, even the peeping of frogs, such faint sounds as these are for the most part heard above the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, which so unhallowed is ever the moan birds. The moan of the earth makes is so, after all, a very faint sound, infinitely inferior in volume to its creakings of joy and gleeful murmurs, so that we may expect the next balloonist will rise above the utmost range of discordant sounds into the region of pure melody. Never so loud was the wail, but it seemed to taper off into a piercing melody, a note of joy which lingered not among the clods oh, right. of the valley. Don't... What? It's the piece of the whale. The, he's talking about a the what? Sound of the whale. Sound of the whale. Mm -hmm. How'd you find the whale in there? It's the reversal word. Oh, the whale. The W-A-I-L. Loud was the whale. It's not a whale. <laughs> he's it's speaking... Okay. In abstract expressionism, <laughs> he did it. Uh, to write it twice, and our uh, specialty is not to know. So uh, the fact that I don't know anything makes me the foremost scholar in this area. The flow of spirits in youth. Now his spirits are flowing in his youth. <laughs> September 15th, how unaccountable the flow of spirits in youth. 
You may throw sticks and dirt into the current, and it will only rise the higher. Dam it up, you may, but dry it up, you may not, for you cannot reach its source. Do we have a current flowing in us? If you stop up this avenue or that anon, it will come gurgling out where you least expect and washed away all its fixtures. You've grasped at happiness as an unalienable right. Do you think you people think that they're entitled to happiness? <laughs> hmm? The young teenage boys think they're entitled. To, to, are they entitled to the, the most beautiful girl in town? <laughs> You grasp at happiness as an unalienable right. The tear does now sooner gush than glisten. Who shall say when the tear that sprung of sorrow first sparkled with joy? Now well, we know they flow with spirit to the youth. Hmm. Hmm. Did you once flow with spirit as a youth? You didn't. You had no flow. Uh -huh. You had a lot of flow. Hmm. Hmm. Alma Natura, September 20th. It is a luxury to muse by a wall side. In the sunshine of a September afternoon, to cuddle down under a gray stone and hearken to the siren song of the cricket. Hmm. Day and night seem henceforth but accidents, and the time is always a still eventide, and as the close of a happy day, parched fields and new looms fielded with the slanting rays are my diet. I know of no word so fit to express this best position of nature as Alma Natura. Hmm. Byron now. This is Lord Byron, I guess. December 8th. Nothing in nature is sneaking or chapfallen as somewhat maltreated and slighted, but each is satisfied with its being, and so is as lavender and balm. If skunk cabbage is offensive to the nostrils of men, still as has it not dropped in consequence, but truthfully unfolded its leaf of two hands breadth. What was it to Lord Byron, whether England owned or disowned him, whether he smelled sour or was skunk cabbage to the English nostril or violet like? The pride of the land, an ornament to every lady's boudoir. Let not the oyster grieve that he has lost the race he has gained as an oyster. Didn't Byron support Greece in a battle against England? No, against the Turks. The Turks. <laughs> well, I don't, do you know what he's talking about? Well, we don't know the details, but Byron wrote poetry, and he's. I know. I like his poetry. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll leave it to them. I'm just a two-bit scribe that does the reading, and the, the analysis is left to the listener. So, on YouTube. <laughs> Of, uh, and you do the analysis. <laughs> mm -hmm. 1838. We read 1838. This is pre, has to be before Walden. In the journals. Of, hmm? but the Greek Revolution is 1821? Very good. Fortunately, we have a Greek scholar. <laughs> Do we need like um, a Hindu scholar? Uh, Do we need an English scholar? Hmm. 
We were reading in the journal, selected journals of Thoreau, just selected, the best. These were the best parts. Um, but we didn't determine what was best, we just took it as granted. We assume that this is the best of the Thoreau's journals. <laughs> hmm. We just assume hmm. through the lack of time. Look at all these from the journal. What are these selections? Uh, the journals run from 1837 all the way to 1862. <laughs> He's a man who, remember when Emerson said, do you keep a journal? <laughs> One day Emerson said, are you keeping a journal? And from that day, he kept a journal. So they could see the power of the words of one man on another. That's the power. If I say one sentence to somebody and influences them properly, they write 7,000 pages of journal <laughs> and then become a transcendentalist poet and philosopher. What, what did we read about one of the, what they say almost all, most of American literature came out of one town, five year time period, between 1840 and 1850, 1845 and 1850s. All American literature was written in one town, in one five year period. The rest, <laughs> the rest of the literature. Yeah, but the rest of the literature is just my beard. Between 1935 and 1950. We just read 18. So, we don't claim to be the foremost scholar of. American literature, that's why we're not scholastic enough. But the scholars, they won't do it, they won't read anything because they're too busy with scholastic research. All right, anything else? Did you enjoy the reading? Was it meaningful? We read about, to summarize, the highlights of the reading, the recap. And we talked about how he went to, he went to Maine and he, he talked a little about his Indian friend, the guide. We talked about Anglo-Saxons as being a reckless crew. We know that the Anglo-Saxons are quite bawdy. They're not. They were kind of rough. They weren't nice to the Indians, even. And we read about society and about how the sons of Greece, and maybe Thoreau was a son of Greece in a way, and how Sunday is good to have a sunny day on Sunday. And what to do if you don't know what to do. It says here what to do. And I suggested that you could, if you don't know what to do, you could just meditate. <laughs> and he says that each one's world is but a clearing in the forest. Is your world just a clearing in the forest? Then we read a poem about May morning and we read a section on consciousness. And we read about resources, sort of about while he went to Walden. And we read Spear Music and we read Byron. And we read all about. 1838, in the best of Thoreau's journals.